This flute, for instance, was inspired by a find underneath a big stone in what you could call a Pueblo little adobe apartment inside of a big cave, the cave dwellers of the Pueblo peoples, and this has been known as the Anasazi flute. This is my rendition of the Anasazi flute. <laughs> Welcome to Opportuno, episode 43, Eric the Flute Maker. This podcast episode is simply an introduction and not the complete story of Eric Sampson, also known as Eric the Flute Maker. For more information about Eric the Flute Maker, I encourage you to visit Eric Sampson's website ericthefluidmaker.com. In the description area of this podcast, you'll find a link to his website, as well as other links to websites, videos, etc., where you can learn more about Eric the Flute Maker. Now, let's begin with today's podcast episode, Eric the Flute Maker. Eric Sampson has been playing and making flutes for over 50 years. It is rare that you meet someone that places the importance of following their dream over the importance of living a life in the pursuit of money, material possessions, fame, or fortune. Eric Sampson is a great example of how following your dreams can lead your life's journey to wonderful destinations, unique adventures, and opportunities to help your fellow man. The goals in life that you are pursuing, or you could say that you are chasing, will not only determine your destination, but also determine your adventures along the way to that destination. That is why, as much as possible, along your journey of life, try to chase things that are not solely based on the accumulation of wealth and possessions, but chase things that can provide knowledge and truth about the many wonderful things in the world and chase ideas and concepts that would not only benefit you, but benefit others. Eric decided to settle in Florida due to the great flute making bamboo, called Bambusa Multiplex, that grew in southern China and settled into Japan for centuries. It arrived by steamship from Yokohama to San Francisco and came by train to Florida in the mid-1880s, settling into the subtropical gardens of pioneer horticulturalists and then into the earliest plant nurseries which spread the bamboo around Florida. Eric now lives in a bamboo grove in Florida and is still making music and making flutes. Eric has been harvesting different kinds of bamboo in the USA, Mexico, Guatemala, Argentina, Brazil, Hawaii, Costa Rica, and Fiji, where he got to play for their president. Eric says that, your flute will be a friend for life. As an outside observer, it seems like Eric's love of flute music led him on his journey to utilize bamboo for making flutes and sharing his music and flutes with the world. However, Eric's journey also led him to finding families and people in Nicaragua that needed help. Nicaragua is the largest country in Central America. It shares borders with Honduras to the north, the Caribbean Sea to the east, Costa Rica to the south, and the Pacific Ocean to the west. Eric Sampson started Flute Maker Ministries, having the website flutemakerministries.org. Flute Maker Ministries is committed to offer the children of Nicaragua a chance at a better future and is helping hundreds of special needs children in Nicaragua. Please consider supporting the work of Flute Maker Ministries in their goal to touch the world with practical love. You'll find ways to help and donate at his website, flutemakerministries.org. Bamboo is an incredibly sustainable resource due to its rapid growth rate making it a nearly infinite source to make many products. Furthermore, unlike traditional building materials such as wood, concrete, and steel, bamboo has a significant environmental benefit in that it has a negative carbon footprint. By absorbing up to four times more carbon dioxide than certain tree species, bamboo is an effective means of reducing carbon emissions. Eric Sampson is helping to preserve and keep flutes from thousands of years ago. From becoming lost in time. According to archaeological findings, the whole Fells flute, 
spelled H-O-H-L-E-F-E-L-S, found in the Hohlfels cave in southwestern Germany in 2008, is considered the oldest known flute. Experts estimate its age to be around 35,000 to 40,000 years old, and it is constructed from a vulture bone. This ancient instrument has a simple design, featuring five finger holes and no mouthpiece. Its discovery offers insight into the significant role that music has played in human culture for thousands of years. Bamboo flutes have been utilized in various cultures for centuries, which makes it challenging to pinpoint the oldest known bamboo flute. Nevertheless, the most ancient surviving bamboo flutes that have been found are from the Han Dynasty in China, spanning from 206 BC to 220 AD. These bamboo flutes, known as Dizzy, spelled D-I-Z-I, featured six finger holes and a blowing hole. They remain significant cultural treasures as they are still utilized in traditional Chinese music today. Eric has master flutes, of many varieties of flutes, from modern and ancient cultures, all over the world. The following is the audio from one of Eric's YouTube videos, entitled, The Master Flutes, on Eric the Flute Maker YouTube channel, with Eric in his flute making workshop, as he selects, and plays many of the master flutes, from which he models the flutes he makes. Hey there, this is Eric the Flute Maker at the Eric the Flute Maker marking station. And uh, when we get ready to uh, build instruments from the different sizes of bamboo, we have to figure out what we're going to do. Uh, what scale, what culture flute. Every, every bamboo piece has a voice and it's talking to you, telling you what it would best do. And that sort of comes after a season of spending time. And we've had 40 eight years. Uh, this will be my 49th year in September making flutes. Um, so I'm surrounded by master flutes here. And uh, what we'll basically do is pull down a flute, figure out uh, what flute. See, this would be too small to be the Anasazi flute. But let me talk about the master flutes a little bit, not necessarily the part about flute making right now. So this flute, for instance, was inspired by a find underneath a big stone in what you could call a Pueblo little uh, adobe apartment inside of a, a big cave, and the, the cave dwellers of the Pueblo peoples. And this has been known as the Anasazi flute. Um, it was actually a rim blown flute, which is quite difficult to blow. So I made it into the Andean Kenna mouthpiece uh, concept and uh, from published uh, notes in the early 50s we were able to reproduce the flute. This is my uh, rendition of the Anasazi flute. <laughs> call this an exotic scale. And uh, I found that keeping the peace sign fingers together here makes the flute have more poetry. Uh, and, and because this is a large flute, it has a deeper voice. Here is another exotic scale um, uh, with the end blown concept. And this one was inspired um, by a find also in a cave. Uh, and this is sort of uh, an article that came out about it. Um, Ancient flute sheds light on origins of music. And here it says, flute music wafted in caves 35,000 years ago in the same area that uh, this bone flute was found in 12 different pieces. Um, some mammoth uh, relics were found also. So this is an ice age flute. Uh, you can't see it from where you are, but that would represent a hole that um, is cut in half and um, the bottom of the flute was never found. So what I did is I took this top hole and put it in the back so you could reach the other ones. I included that hole and then I 
uh, stretched the bottom of the instrument to where it was in tune with the holes. And this is what I call the Ice Age flute. joys on on uh, this flute was uh, one of my customers took it back into the very cave where it was found and uh, bought two one for the archaeologist and one for her and she got uh, to go in and play uh, moving along in show and tell here let's uh, jump into the uh, meditation flute this was uh, one that had two small holes, and right at the moment I was going to burn the small holes bigger in 1975. I left those two holes small to see what I had, and it was so great we put it on the market, and thus I call this the meditation flute. And this last hole is kind of like the da da at the end of a concert. So this is sort of the, or you might say this is the root note where you begin and where you end, and that's the da da feel. <laughs> And uh, this um, kind of moves into the Asian um, part of the map where uh, the Japanese shakuhachi, which was an end-blown flute with a root, uh, 7th century. This is a side-blown. <laughs> Tonic for top holes and one in the back. Interesting uh, uh, that that bamboo actually came from southern China, settled into Japan for centuries, uh, and uh, Taiho Chiko it was called, and Subo Chiko in Japan, and here it was called in the early uh, 1880s. Um, Bambusa argentia striata, today it's known as Bambusa multiplex, uh, also from Japan, 1600s. Um, this was uh, created by the gentleman who created the uh, Koto scale, and I call this the In Sen flute. <laughs> So let me tweak this again with some crazy reverb. And you can see how a flute with great acoustics, either natural or um, placed in it with reverb, uh, makes a flute just have such a, brings you right up to the edge of almost um, a, a spiritual place.
That's why most people who end up playing flute and recording will always record with reverb and delay. In the major scales, uh, major scales are great because they can play all different kinds of music, major, minor, pentatonic, so you can cover all different cultures. And your basic uh, Greek major scale is spitting out watermelon seeds harder. To, to play a flute well is sort of like riding a horse. You have to get up on the horse before you can go up on the horse, and you need to get up on the horse and sit correctly, nicely balanced, holding the reins correctly, uh, not too tight, not too loose, um, and uh, feet in the stirrups, and then you can lean in and communicate with the horse and you can go. And then you can go at a canter or a walk or a gallop, and before you can go with a flute, you have to uh, have it snug, balanced, pressing the flute against you. You're becoming one with the flute here, because you are part of the flute. So there's the snugness, there's a little bit of firmness, um, you're creating a circle of pressure and a little bit smaller than the G major is my uh, calypso flute here and uh, the bigger the flute the deeper the toot so this is more of an island feel and uh, makes a great jazz flute also Peace sign fingers together, the secret to jazz. Roll or bend the second note. Little humming. So nice little uh, concept there. Um, uh, staying in the Asian feel for just a moment, this would be the little Chinese flute. I call it my Chinese flute for a little money. I call it your Chinese flute. It, uh, it was inspired by a professor asking me to take these notes and create an instrument for a um, theatrical production. And uh, I was at a speaking once at a, at a Chinese Bible study in uh, Miami. And when I said, this is the Chinese food, a beautiful lady said, oh, this is not the Chinese food. And she was right. This is a, a Chinese sounding flute that I call my Chinese flute. God bless her. of these flutes um, have been inspired from different, uh, uh, they were going into a Mideastern feel now. Somebody gave me um, an Egyptian ney. Uh, the ney is a, quite the difficult flute to, to blow. Uh, so what I did was I put the Western side blown concept, uh, pulled two holes out that just didn't seem to make any sense. And what I had left was such a beautiful flute, I reproduced that calling it my Egyptian flute. Again, a little bit uh, modified and inspired by the Egyptian name. <laughs> I love that flute very much. Uh, if I was stuck in an elevator for four hours, that that probably would be my flute uh, to take. Um, this is the uh, Arabian uh, flute. This is the large. Uh, is recommended for someone who can stretch their hand. Um, has a pinky hole, and uh, here we go. Another flute 
just like this but smaller is what I call the medium Arabian. So if you have a, a liking to this scale, you might want to consider if your hand is medium to small. And uh, this one is a harmonic minor, more uh, leaning towards a Renaissance feel. I call this the counselor because it has notes that seem to uh, to be uh, uh, counseling the soul as you play. Something a little bit smaller and uh, handspan friendly is definitely one of my favorite flutes. I call it the Vivaldi flute. Same scale, higher voice. When a flute player talks about the root note, he's talking about the bottom note, where music will start and music will will end. And in between is where you're going up and down the scale. High do. So the minor scale is very easy to improvise. Here's using two fingers. I do. Octave. And ending at the beginning. Um, so it gives you a feel for uh, some of our master flutes and basically what I do is I take a pencil and I take the flute that uh, is going to be made from the different pieces and uh, I guess the challenge for me always is when you cut one pole it's going to give you a bunch of different stuff. Uh, so hope we can uh, see you again in the future at Eric the Flute Maker. I find it fascinating how Eric has been able to create so many master flutes from many time periods to use these master flutes as a model to create more flutes. I think the world owes Eric much gratitude for not only playing and making flutes but being able to help preserve ancient flute designs of times past, as well as reminding us how music has been treasured and enjoyed by mankind for thousands of years. Having replicas of ancient flutes allows us to hear the same musical notes that were played and heard by people's flutes hundreds and even thousands of years ago. I encourage you to check out Eric Sampson's ericthefluteMaker.com website as well as Eric the Flute Maker YouTube channel. 
Also, please visit Eric's website, flutemakerministries.org. All these links to his websites and YouTube channel are available in the description area of this podcast. The following is audio of Eric's message, entitled, The Parable of the Flutemaker, that is also available on the Eric the Flutemaker YouTube channel. When I make a flute, I'm actually challenged whether or not I'm going to, uh, where I'm going to harvest. I harvest in, in Florida. And when I go into the harvest place, I'm surrounded by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bamboo poles. And, and it's a dark place. And this reminds me of Jesus coming into my own darkness. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And all of a sudden, I remember when he called his disciples. And if you have Jesus in your heart, he's called. And I've picked the ones that I want to be with. And I remember Jesus picked the disciples that day he wanted to hang out with and be with. And he wants to be with you next week and next month and forever. And I pick the ones, and when I see the distances and the widths, I know what they're going to be. I know it's going to be a, 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 an oriental flute or an Arabian flute, a major, a minor scale, a bamboo sax, a soprano alto tenor, a thin penny whistle. I, and, and I rejoice, and I can hear in my memory what they're going to be. And when the Lord saw you in your darkness, he knew what he wanted to do with you. And all of a sudden, I take my saw, and, and that bamboo piece will never again be the same. And when you came to Jesus, you will never again be the same. And I pull it out of darkness into his wonderful light, into the kingdom of his beloved son. Great place to be. I take the bamboo home and I build these big teepees and the sun goes by and it begins to cure and God wants us to mature. Why? Because he's making us into an instrument. And in a few days, the green leaves begin to to curl. In a month or so, they're down on the ground. The bamboo from green is turning beige. It's dying to its old self, but it's becoming something new, just like us. And all of a sudden, I have a problem. It's the same problem that I noticed that Jesus has with us. All of a sudden, in the maturing process, there's all this junk. There's all these, these, these branches laying around that I can't use to make a flute. And there's all this stuff when we come to the Lord that he can't use to make us an instrument. And we need to be willing to let him take that stuff. And then I put it in this this big wooden thing I call the bamboo chute, open up a little porthole, go into my shop, turn on the electric saw, and I begin to run these big long pieces of bamboo, maybe 18 feet long. And if the bamboo could speak at that moment, what might it say? I hear the sound of a great electric saw. Who's it for? And the master would say, it's for you. What do you mean for me? Didn't you take me out of darkness? Yes. Or weren't you betraying me? Yes. Well, didn't you clip what you didn't? What are you doing? Well, you're too long. You're too big. I need to work on this part, and then this part, and then this part. Part, and, I, and God wants to work on this part, and this part, and this part, and shod your feet with the gospel of peace. And if you could hear that going through right there, what would the, what would the sound of the bamboo be? Ah, ah, no, it's more like, ah, ah. When God humbles us, it hurts. But we're in his hand and in his workshop. When I got saved, I wanted to go all through the world and share Jesus. And I had the, oh, brother, I had this gorgeous sister, this gorgeous hair. Look how God humbled this guy. Now, the beautiful one here is my beautiful Prince Jesus of Nazareth, not Eric the flute maker. Then I turn the water on and I wash it. God wants us to be clean. Then I take the perfect flute from the wall and I put it right next to that piece of bamboo that's been cut and washed. Who is the perfect one in our lives? Jesus. And I put it there and I take a pencil and I begin to mark where the holes, because if that one came out great, this one will come out great. And we want Jesus to be right by ourselves and we find him in prayer, we find him in fellowship, we find him in the word. We even, even the nature of God reflects his glory and we can see him there. And I, I'm a copy and how was Jesus? Well, he was the... In- Image of the invisible father. We want to know how how is the father looked at Jesus. He loved kids. We should love kids. He spoke the truth. We shouldn't walk on our lives with with lies. Amen. He was compassionate. We should be compassionate. Led of the spirit. We should learn to be led of the spirit. After they're marked, I put the irons in the fire. They get red hot. If it could speak, what would it say? Hmm, fire. Who's it for? (laughs) Ha ha, for you. Why me? Because I'm going to mark you. And you'll never again be the same. In hard times, if you stay in my hand, you will never be the same. You will learn, be changed, and be able to comfort those through what you go through. And at that moment where those red hot irons go in, if it could speak, what would it say? Ah! But you're in the hands of the master. Don't run away from the master's hand. 
in difficult times. Then I sand the bamboo. Every piece of bamboo has a different story to tell. Two pieces of bamboo here. We're going like this in the storms of life and the wind. And the master at this point, he has to take a special sandpaper and he's, he's cleaning it. Let God heal those places. Because the more character the flute has and it's been healed, worked on, the more beauty and value it has. Let the Lord heal us so we might be a blessing to others. Amen. And then before even playing it, I have to take this brush and clean it out. God wants our hearts clean. Once in a while, I'll be working and the phone might ring and I might, you know, I forget and I put this flute in the wrong pile and it gets to the market and I get ready to play and it doesn't have volume. I go, what's going on? I don't care about playing it anymore. I want to see if it's got a, it's got a break, if there's a little bug hole. I go, oh my goodness. It's dirty. It left the shop. Guys, when we go to be with each other, let's not leave the workshop without him cleaning our hearts, amen. Because when, when the flute is clean, it has strength, it has volume, and God wants us clean with a good testimony, not walking in shame. And then it's ready to be played. And when I play it for the first time, I'm wanting to see if it's in tune. When the master hears the instrument in tune, he releases the blessing. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Now you can represent me. But before letting the flute out of the shop, I take oil. And I oil it. And God wants us to be oiled. Amen. Filled with the Spirit. Joy. But you know what the Holy Spirit also tells us and is talking to us continually. What is he saying a lot of the time? He's telling us, guiding us not to do something. My five-year-old, she's 26 now. When she was five, she said, Daddy, I think I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I said, Hannah, what happened? He spoke to me. I said, Hannah, what did he say? Oh, Daddy, he said, don't do that. <laughs> we look and strive, and God is always telling you, don't, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Amen? Amen. I've been enjoying being a flute maker. Great. Let us go on. This is a minor scale. If it could speak in a microphone tonight, what might it say? Good evening. I'm a minor scale. <gasps> I wish I was a major scale. <gasps> no, 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 no. Wait a minute. If the master made you into a minor scale, shouldn't you be the best minor scale in these parts? Oh, yeah. oh okay, okay. I started making flutes when I was 18 years old in Mexico. I'd seen a beggar that didn't have any legs. My heart went out to him. He was holding a hat begging, and I gave him my best flute. And at that moment, I think God must have said, Aha! Now watch what I can do. And the next place I settled in, I became a flute maker. Haven't stopped since then. It's been 35 years, made over 100,000 flutes. And I'm reminded of that scripture, Cast your bread upon the waters, and in many days it shall return. And whoever we are, we seem to be having this thing saying, Lord, I, I'm a minor flute. I don't like the way I am. But you know how precious the minor flute is. And you are precious. And what I like when I travel so much, Daniel, is when I meet people that are not afraid just to love. Let the minor scale. Hear it out. It's so sweet. Be sweet in Jesus. Amen? This is a double flute. When we sell these, we tell our customers, double your pleasure, double your fun, double our income. Yes, but spiritually speaking, it reminds me of the connection we have with the Lord. We are not alone in this world. You are now joined to the Lord. You are not abandoned. He has given you the spirit whereby you can cry out, Abba, Father, and you walk the walk, not as an orphan, but as a child of the king connected to him. And how sad it is when we actually see people connected to the Lord that live a life that's not happy. It shouldn't be like this. If 
The Lord is there, and yes, the Lord is there if you've let him in. There should be adventure and joy in your walk. Enjoy your walk with the Lord. Amen? This is a Native American flute. We call it the Kiowa Love Flute. We tell our customers for little money, this is called your Kiowa Love Flute. But spiritually speaking, it reminds me of the invitation the Holy Spirit is making these days for his body to get more serious with prayer, deeper in prayer. Brothers, if the only prayer life you have this week is, Father, bless this food that I'm about to receive, there's more. Amen? This is a praying food. You can almost hear the historical pain in the native communities. But spiritually speaking, it reminds you of the Christian lifting up prayer to God. Listen to the flute praying. about prayer. This flute was made by myself and my friend Alan Guffey. I live in Florida. To go to Alan's house, I had to take two flights, get to Tucson, Arizona, rent a car, and drive three and a half hours through the mountains. And when I get to his house, it's a nice big wooden house. I went walking to the outside, and he says, Eric, I fear because everything is so dry that we're going to get a forest fire. I said, Alan, look at this beautiful day. And he says, no, no, you don't understand. It's very, very dry. And I'm looking at the pine trees. And I said, Alan, don't worry about it. And my time there is over. And I fly home. And I'm making flutes one day and listening to NPR. And all of a sudden, the guy on the radio says, in just a moment, and Alan lives in a little town called Pinedale, Arizona. And the guy on the radio says, in a little while, a forest fire 13 miles wide is about to cross the small town of Pinedale, Arizona. And I go, Pinedale, Arizona. Pinedale, Arizona. And the guy in the radio says, yes, Pinedale, Arizona. No, no, it wasn't, wasn't exactly like that. But I go, Pinedale, Arizona. That's Alan's house. Alan's house. And I wanted to pray protection on Alan's house. And I didn't have the words. And I go, oh, God, Alan's house. God, protect him. And all of a sudden, whoo, the words started to come. And I began to say, Father, in the name of Jesus, put a hedge of protection around Alan's house. Lord, protect him, Father, in Jesus' name. And I ran that with that horse for a little while, and all of a sudden the prayer lifted up. And, and at 6.30, I ran from my shop into the house and turned on the uh, ABC News. And I, and I think the first or the second thing uh, Peter Jennings said that night was, uh, just a moment ago, a, a forest fire 13 miles wide has crossed the tiny town of Pinedale, Arizona, and I yelled for my wife, Linda, Linda, come quickly, let's pray for Alan's house. Lord, in the name of Jesus, a hedge of protection the next morning. Like a good husband, I was taking the garbage out to the side of the road. The sun was just coming up, and there was the Miami Herald, and I reached down, and I picked it up, and I took the plastic off and put it in my pocket, and I wanted to see what were the headlines as I walked into the house. There was just enough light to see it, and as I looked there, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was Alan's house. <laughs> With the answer to my prayer, a big airplane was coming down right over it, dumping what they call slurry. Behind the smoke was lit up by the color of the fire. I brought that picture to show you. Ooh. Here is Alan's house. Here is the airplane and the color of the fire behind. When I saw Alan's house, I ran out of the house. I said, Linda, wake up! Linda, wake up! She was sleeping. <laughs> Linda, wake up! The only time I ever hit her with a booty saber. Linda, wake up! Linda, look, look, God, answer! I mean, the article said that the flames were 200 feet tall. And the fire went on this side of his house and on this side of the house and didn't touch his house. He lost this tree right here. Guys, when God moves you in prayer, 
Go with God. Amen. That concludes Eric Sampson's message, The Parable of the Flute Maker. Thanks for listening. Please visit opportuno.org. Thank you. To hear many more flute songs by Eric Sampson, you can listen to his flute music on his Eric the Flute Maker channel on SoundCloud. The link to the Eric the Flute Maker SoundCloud channel is in the description area of this podcast. To close out this podcast episode, the following are four selections of music from many of Eric Sampson's flute music with the four following flute music selections entitled, in the order they will be played, are Oriental Flute, Journey's Rest D. Penny Whistle, Whispers of Spring Oriental Flute, Panda's Dream and The Shepherd's Song Now, on to playing four of Eric Sampson's flute musicals. <laughs>